Let's talk about HDLs, the most confusing of the lot. Now, we've already done dedicated podcasts on this topic. We've spoken at length about this. So uh, we're not going to be able to obviously cover this in too much detail, and we'll point people back towards the previous podcast where I've done this. But um, you've already alluded to the fact that HDLs can be protective. This has led... Mm, many people to refer to HDL as the so-called good cholesterol. And if your quote unquote good cholesterol is high, yeah, you don't need to worry about anything. Um, I'm not going to ask you to debunk that because the tone of my question already suggests that that's nonsensical. So let's let's have, you know, kind of a, a, a modest but but brief discussion on how HDLs work and why is it that when they're functioning, they can be quite protective um, but at the same time, maybe say a word about why, unfortunately, we can't figure this out or discern this from blood tests. Yep. And it's so important and it's so unknown out there in the real world. And in the layman's world, it's probably not known at all because they keep reading these idiotic missives in newspapers and magazines that, boy, check your good cholesterol. And even if it's high, you don't have to worry about your bad cholesterol, LDL it's uh, so sad. It's well, even sadder that some providers still believe this and tell their patients that. All right. So it, basically what we say very quickly to any patients is uh, as we're teaching them about lipoproteins and what they do and what they carry, uh, we get to a point where we say we're not going to talk about HDLs anymore. Now, don't get me wrong. HDL particles are incredibly important to both your cardiovascular system and probably many other tissues in their, your body. And that means HDLs perform a lot of functions that, especially with the heart, may be very cardioprotective. We also know that some people have the type of HDLs that don't perform those cardioprotective functions. They actually perform bad functions to the artery wall and plaque and the heart. So uh, the important thing is you can understand, boy, so it's what HDLs do. Let's call that HDL functionality. And to make a long story short, whether your HDLs are doing those cardioprotective functions or they're doing bad things to your vasculature, whatever they're doing has zero relationship to their cholesterol cargo, meaning your HDL cholesterol level in the blood. There are people with low HDL cholesterol, often a signal for a high cardiovascular risk, but not everybody. And there are people with very high HDL cholesterol have been told they're protected and we know they are not. A group of them gets atherosclerotic disease. A group of them have been described with breast cancer, dementia. So obviously, you can't look at an HDL cholesterol in an individual patient and make extrapolations on what the heck the HDLs are doing in that person. The reason HDLs have these either miraculous or disastrous properties comes down not to their lipid content, certainly not their cholesterol content, but to their two things, their protein content. Over 150 proteins have been found to be associated with various HDL particles, and they perform an immense number of likely very necessary uh, actions that need to go on in certain tissues where things may be going wrong. We also know that the coat of an HDL, apart from its proteins, is virtually all phospholipids. So the exact phospholipid concentration of an HDL surface has tremendous amount to what to do. Can an HDL do wonderful things or bad things? Those phospholipids depend, really determine what an HDL can bind to in various tissues. Now, of course, we can't measure HDL phospholipid content. There are hundreds of phospholipids. You would, <laughs> you would get a lipidome coming back that you, you couldn't even pronounce half of the phospholipids or at least the fatty acids that are in those phospholipids. And same with the protein. If there's 150 of them, I guarantee the average doctor might be familiar with about 10 of those proteins and not with the rest of them. So I don't know how to determine a patient's HDL functionality. Clearly, the people having adverse effects with high HDL cholesterol have dysfunctional HDLs probably related to that proteome or their phospholipid content and vice versa. 
So what we tell a person right now is in the year 2024, we didn't always believe this. This bad cholesterol had an origin that everybody believed way back when. Framingham, Mr. Fit, the earlier observational trials. Nobody ever adjusted for ApoB in those trials. It wasn't even available when they were doing it. So we now know that the people with low HDL cholesterol who do get atherosclerosis always have high ApoB. And why? Why do those people have low HDL cholesterol? I've already told you it's the trigs that knock the HDL. And the trigs may not be 400. The trigs may only be 130, which are being ignored. So, and what is high in them? ApoB. So the proper treatment of low HDL cholesterol in the person you believe has cardiovascular risk is just like trigs, lower ApoB, lower non-HDL cholesterol if you can't get an ApoB. I don't know what to, if somebody has a high HDL cholesterol, I don't know what blood test to tell you. I would always check an ApoB. We do that in 100% of people. And if it was high, we would treat ApoB regardless of an HDL cholesterol level. But I can't look at a man or a woman and say, oh my God, you're the one with high HDLC who might wind up with dementia or some cancer or something. I don't know. So we'll track those other diseases with other modalities that we have at our beck and call. I don't know what to tell you about your cardiovascular health if you have high HDLC, but I can guarantee you it is not a declaration of cardiac immortality. So it's HDL functionality. And you recall the, the we had a nice email exchange about a, a, a friend of mine who's I've known for many years. He's always had a very high HDL cholesterol and a very low LDL cholesterol. Um, in fact, his HDL has routinely been above 100 milligrams per deciliter, um, and his LDL cholesterol has always been below 100 milligrams per deciliter. So this is this is a guy that, by anybody's metric, looks like he's in tip-top shape. Um, but I did suggest to him at one point, you know, it, it would be reasonable to at least do a calcium score because, you know. We'd, I've seen these case studies of individuals with high HDLC, low LDLC, who still end up having atherosclerosis, and it can be quite aggressive because it could be that that high HDL cholesterol is actually a marker of, of dysfunctional HDL that are having a difficult time clearing it. To make a long story short, he ended up having quite a high calcium score, and so now he's on very aggressive treatment to to take any residual risk out of that ApoB. So he's on you know double therapy now, and he walks around with an ApoB in the twenty to thirty range, and and hopefully that's going to be sufficient to retard this. Um, but again, always a great story. I remember you sharing that I remember you sharing that case with me and I my God, why the heck did you do a CAC? And because you've heard me spout enough, you learned your lesson. I don't use HDLC to make any decision. Yeah. It, 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 I distinctly remember reading a case study 10 years ago about a woman who looked just like that and ended up having very advanced atherosclerosis. Thank you.